Very, very important topic. Um, what 10 things kids wish their parents know. Um, let me just take a scan of the room to be sure. Um, your child? Okay, great. Um, you're a teacher? Are you? Teacher? You've got children here? Sorry? Students, okay. Um, all right, it's a different world. Um, it's a different world that we're living in now. Um, the world that we grew up in. Sorry, I didn't ask Madam. Um, teacher too? Parent? Parent. Children yet? Okay. Madam, you're welcome. Um, so I started by saying it's a different world. Um, I guess, I guess the food that the world is eating now and the um, kind of drinks that our children are drinking now and from whatever plant and whatever chemical they use in producing them has changed the way um, that we are supposed to relate with them. Um, the way our parents related with us was totally different. And sometimes I hear parents say, but that's how I was brought up. That's how I was brought up. Um, and I, I, I came out good. You know, um, but there's, there, there are changes, and we have to acknowledge we have to acknowledge those changes, right? So, just trying to wait for us to have. Um, all right, we set to now. Okay, so um, I think the first thing to talk about when we begin to look at this kind of discourse, things children wish their parents know, I think the, the first thing to, to talk about is how did we even get to a level where uh, the children would wish their parents knew something that they do not know? How did we get, even get to that level? And I think the crux of the matter would be we don't know because we're not listening, right? If we were listening, we wouldn't be here discussing it. Um, so there are different levels of listening, right? There are different levels of listening. There, there's just listening, listening to the words, there's listening to the body language, there's listening, listening to their perception, listening to their views. And one of the reasons why I think that we're not listening Mm -hmm. One of the reasons why I think we're not listening is because there is an automatic judgmental state that we put ourselves. I'll say it again. There's an automatic judgmental state that we put ourselves. When I say judgmental, I mean we have already decided what is right and what is wrong. Um, we have already come to conclusion what should be and what should not be. And we already have our likes and our dislikes as parents, as teachers. We already have our preferences and our prejudices. And whether it's the children or it's your husband or your friend or at work, once you have a prejudice on something, you block it out, right? I'm sure you have things that you don't like. And when people do those things to you, what do you do? You block it out. And that is being judgmental. Now, it's not a bad thing, but it might not help you. Because the difference between being judgmental and being curious is that when you are judgmental, you block yourself from listening to what is happening on the other side. But when you are curious, what do you do? You are open. And when you are open, you are able to listen. And when you listen, you would know. And we would find ourselves in situations where the children are wishing there's things, there are things that the parents should know that they don't know. And this, this state of curiosity is not something you do once and you're done. The big question would be, why are you not being curious? The biggest problem here is listening. Why are you not being curious? Because 
Once you're judgmental, I don't like this, I don't want to see it, you block the capacity to listen, and you would not know. Um, the truth is, our children know far beyond what we think they know. I want you to think of any of your child, right? Just think of any of them. And I want you to come to a conclusion as we speak here, as we sit here, that they know far beyond what you think they know. And that's not because you're not doing what you need to do as parents, but that's because you're not with, with, you're not with them all the time. So what they are picking in different places, you are not aware. And when they pick, it gets into their subconscious, and you don't even know. So, so my charge for you today would be, as parents, as good parents, as loving parents, not bad, we're not even talking about bad parenting here, as loving parents, as good parents, as caring parents, we already are judgmental. I need you to take that away. As lovely teachers, you are already judgmental. You are judgmental because there's something one child is doing that you like and another child is not doing it. And that alone creates that judgment state. But this is somebody doing it. Why is this person not doing like that? And once you find yourself in that judgmental state, you are no longer curious and you will not listen anymore. The greatest strength of a parent, the greatest strength of a teacher is curiosity. Curiosity would open your heart and it will allow you to listen to the things that you don't like. You see, it's very difficult for you to be curious about lies when you hate lies so much. It's very curious for you to, it's very difficult for you to be curious about what you define as laziness when you're a very hardworking person. Right? It's very difficult for you to be curious about your child who is not your personality. And to be curious and open to the child that is your personality. So the, the discourse here is going to be the reason why there are things that children wish their parents know about themselves, about them that parents don't know. The reason why we're having that discussion is because we're not listening enough. And listening is blocked because we're judgmental. We are judgmental because we already have our likes and dislikes, preferences and prejudices, do's and don'ts. So, if you want to go away with anything from this discussion today, it will be, how do I begin to stay curious about the things that I don't like? Yeah. Um, First of all, I can see myself being recorded. <laughs> yeah, but um, how it's going to be shared, I'm not sure. But when I see one of the organizers now, I would ask. You have a question, madam. How do you draw the line between what? Between being judgmental yeah. and then still being, being able to be open to it because, or, or not trying to force them you know, along the lines of our prejudices because there is good and bad, right? There is right and wrong. You know, so there Hopefully. Is, there is, <laughs> 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 well, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, yeah. So thank you for the question. One of the challenges to very deep thoughts is that when you're hearing it, you are also coming to conclusion. So please, I want to beg you. It's just going to be 30 minutes, but I'm going to beg you. Anything that I don't say in my mouth, don't make a conclusion around it. So for example, I've not said, don't draw a line. But you heard it. But I didn't say it. <laughs> right? I didn't, I didn't say don't draw a line, 
Um, I think you said two other things that I didn't say. I can't remember them now. So the first thing is about being open. Being open does not mean don't correct. Being open does not mean don't draw a line. Being open does not mean don't have your preferences and prejudices. In fact, as a human being, you will definitely have your preferences and prejudices. Being open simply means you have the capacity to listen more, to hear more, to see more, irrespective of what your judgmental state is telling you at a particular point in time. And it takes a lot of emotional intelligence to do that. Right? I know that is a lie. I hate lies, but I want to hear more. I'm going to spank that child, but before I spank the child, I want to hear more. Now, the capacity to wait before you spank is where we find out whether you are open, curious, or not. I don't think we can parent our child without a level of discipline. We're going to destroy those children because discipline means very simple. There's something we want to stick at and we stick at it, right? So um, I started all of this like this because it's not about the list, the 10 things or the 15 things. It's always about who we are and what we bring to the table. And I'm going to call my first son to also give a thought because as we were driving down today, I decided to also ask them in Boon Curious, you know, what, what is that thing that you think parents should know um, about, I mean, children, sh parents should know that their children are wishing they should know about them. I, and he said something very important. And I'm going to be very vulnerable because he even said it in the area of my own expertise. I'm hoping that he didn't say it because I'm always saying it <laughs> and I need to do it more, right? So, so I'm going to tell you a story um, of a of a 15 years old, 17 years old that I worked on about three years, four years ago, before COVID. Um, he found himself in a very depressed state, very depressed. He's a Bab Babcock student, no, Covenant student, Covenant University student. He was depressed, he has attempted suicide, and I needed to work with him. Um, they spoke with me on the phone. Um, he couldn't come to me, so I decided to go meet him. And where I went to meet him, I found him stay on the bed. The bed is already stinking. He's been on the bed for about seven days. He's not had his bath. You know, he's barely stood up, ba barely eating, right? And by the time we started to work together, there was only one challenge, just one. And the challenge is simple. The father believes that he's lazy. The father believes that he's unserious. Um, and because of that, between the ages of 11 and the ages of 17, the, the most frequent thing that the guy has heard is that you are not serious, you are lazy. And he has heard it to the extent that he has accepted it. So what happened to him was he was in the university and he wasn't doing well. And because he has heard all of that, he concluded by himself in the university that yes, his father is right. And that got him very sad because he believes he's not achieving anything. Um, now, if his father wasn't saying all of that and he wasn't hearing all of that and his subconscious was not filled with all of that, if he, if he found himself not doing well, he will have other reasons why he's not doing well. But he came to this conclusion because the conclusion is deep-seated. Don't forget that children are created by us, by our genes. The gene of the mother, the father, the, the grandmother, and, and all of that, depending on where science wants to push it, number one. Number two, when they come, they are not without anything. They are already without, with our gene, and then our environment is going to impact on it. The things that they see, the things they hear, the things they experience from you, the things they read around you, would then begin to script them. So they don't come with a will. They came and they received. They received us and they are playing back what they've received from us, from our blood, from our marrows, from our gene. If you have that understanding, then you will not push yourself backward. You will not, you will not deter yourself because yourself is inside the child. You will not reject yourself. So if a child has a bad behavior, it's important for us to know that there's something inside our gene that has also informed it. 
right? And that can help your curiosity. So for this guy, his father came to that conclusion. He got depressed. We worked on him. Now, one month after we started working together, he started picking up himself. And he went home. But he came back terrible. By the time we were having the next session. Because when he got home, the first thing that happened is that the father said he must go and barb his hair because his hair was full. He's not barbed his hair for a long time. And the reason why the father needed him to barb his hair, number one, is because he probably looked unkept, but most importantly, you cannot be around the neighborhood like this. The neighbors will see you, they'll be wondering what is wrong with you. And if you go deep down into that discussion, even though a lot of parents will not agree, it will be that I don't want neighbors to see my children like this because of what the neighbors would say. And so they bounced on the boy again, and they started telling him, you see what I've been saying? Da, 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 da. So all that we've achieved in one month died again. The guy, the guy came back worse. He concluded he was going to leave home. You know, a lot of things like that. This guy became who he was, not because he decided to be, but because of the kind of things that were happening. And by the time I walked with the parents a little, it was just simple. The father is a choleric. The boy is a sanguine. That's the biggest problem. A choleric is a go-getter. A choleric is somebody who um, solves practical problems, who gets things done, you know, who is very fast, who is very concerned about results. A sanguine is somebody who is always excited, who is always playful, you know. And I made them to realize in their house that comedy is playing, right? Football is playing. You play football, right? There are so many things that playing can do with money in terms of career. What am I trying to say? The first thing we need to know um, the first thing we need to know about this topic is that children want us to really know who they are. And that's a very difficult thing. No. Know who they are, know their personalities, know their strength, know their weaknesses, know their challenges. Know. You need to wake up and realize that children are humans. They are, no, they are not small humans. They are not unformed humans. They are full human beings. You have to realize that to be able to come into the idea of what I'm talking about. Um, so the first thing is that we need to know them. And to know them, you have to stay curious. You have to be curious before you impact your judgment on them. I don't say don't... I'm not going to be here to tell you what you should do and what you should not do as a parent. I don't know your values. I don't know your religion, Right? For parents, you have to be curious. Curiosity is opening your mind, holding on, waiting, hearing more, and then before you impact. For teachers, you don't even have a right to pass a judgment because you are not shaping people into your belief system. A parent can even go far to say, I want to shape a child into my belief system. For example, I'm a Christian, and my child must be a Christian. I'm a Hindu, and my child must be a Hindu. A teacher cannot even do that. A teacher does not even have right to do that, right? And so even teachers have to be more open. You understand? That, that's going to be the first thing. And the question you keep, should keep asking yourself is, do I know this child? Don't forget I said something before. I said they know far beyond you think you know about them. That's the truth. Um, what they're watching on YouTube, you probably only know 5% or 10% because we're not there. We're not there, right? So that's going to be the first thing. Um, the second thing, so what's the first one? Children would wish that their parents know them. Know them deeply. And to know them, you need time. And we don't have that time. <laughs> so the little time you're going to spend with them, let it be time where there's a lot of curiosity going on. Let it not be a time of more judgment, versus curious. Let it be a time of more curiosity than judgment. Because once you judge them, once you get home and everywhere is scattered and blah, 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 not good, not, you're not supposed to be like this, da, 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 yeah, go, you do that, you do that. You can spend the next one hour not listening. And then giving instructions, judging, this is not good, that's not good, you're not supposed to do this. Have you done your work? Why are you playing? Da, da, da. And you're just judging and judging and judging and judging. And for two hours, you've given instructions, you've judged, you've not listened. And it's not your fault because you're also stressed. You're also stressed. And maybe somebody else 
ought to be listening to you and the person who is not listening. <laughs> right, and the person is not listening. So take that away. The secret is to be patient a little. To, to, there's something called deferred gratification. Deferred gratification is push away the enjoyment you want to have for a moment. But in this case, it's not enjoyment. You are in stress and you want to deal with the situation so that you can move on. That's enjoyment. Right? You want to quickly correct a child. That's enjoyment. What I'm trying to talk about, can you defer that correction a little bit? Deferred gratification. Can you defer the enjoyment you gain from correction for like two, three minutes and replace that time with listening for a bit before you correct. Now, I'm not saying don't correct your child. But I'm saying that can you defer the, the joy of correction, the enjoyment of correction, the fulfillment of correction. Can you defy it a little bit and use that little space that you're creating to listen before you do what you want to do. You will be shocked that that, that space would give you more information. I was teaching. We're running an emotional intelligence certification and the, the lady paid a lot of money, obviously, about 250K, so she said she must take something away. So after day one, she went home and they were taking the children to school the next day. And something always happens when they get to the gates of the school. Their child doesn't greet. But when he's at home and everywhere, he greets. And every time they, they knock him on the head, they spank him, they force him to greet. And that day, as the father wanted to repeat the same thing, which is what we do, we repeat our patterns as parents. The woman said, no, no, hold on. I want to practice something they taught me yesterday. What is that thing? Ask questions. Be curious. And she asked the boy, why don't you greet when we get here? Why? And we, your father is always beating you and spanking you, and you still don't greet. You know what the guy said? He said, but I don't know their names. And they're like, what, what do you mean you don't know their names? And he said, they said if we want to greet, we should say, good morning, Auntie Favor. Good morning, Uncle Shegun. And I don't know their names. I only know the names of the people inside the school. I don't know the names of the people at the gate. They just pick us in. The woman cried. She cried. Because it was just a small problem. It was a little problem that they used in solving a school's problem. So they realized in the school that they've not even introduced the people at the gate to the children. The children don't know their name. But this young boy has been beaten over, over and over again. What happened on that day? She defied the gratification of spanking the child. She listened and asked questions a little for just like one minute. And a big solution was found. And so when you defy that gratification of judgment... You, you take a pause and then you ask a question and you'll get more. Now, that's going to be difficult when you're irritated. That's going to be difficult when you're annoyed. That's going to be difficult when they've just done something you say they should not do and you've been saying it over and over again. That's going to be difficult when their father has just irritated, done something that you don't like or their mother has just done, or their mother has just done something that you don't like. But that's going to be difficult but it's going, to be, um, it's going to be very gratifying. It's going to be very productive if you just try to practice it. And I didn't say try to do it. What did I say? Try to practice it. The idea is you, pra you practice it. You understand? So what, what do you do when you practice something? You try it. Right? That's what you do when you practice something. You do what? You try it. You try it. Come in, come in, come in, come in. There are seats here. Make it fast. Alright, so the next one I'm going to talk about is children wish their parent knows that they are different from the other child. Now that's a big deal. That's a big deal. Children wish their parents know that they are different from the other child. Teachers, that's going to be very important. I have never 
And I, I, I thank God for the, for the knowledge that I have. I have never compared one child with another. And I will never. They are different. They are different. They are totally, totally different. Totally. It's a very difficult thing to do. Even if you don't say it with your mouth, your body language can say it. But they are different. Um, my first son is, is yeah, his name is Gil. That's my second son. They are two different people. Totally different. Extremely. And I have to wake up to that reality every day. She has the one that produced them. <laughs> They're totally different. If I don't come to that reality, then I'll judge him because of him. I'll judge him because of him. They're different. Their swimming strength is different. Their mathematical, mathematical strength is different. Their numeracy strength is different. Their preferences are different. Uh, their prejudices are different. And I want you to take this difference from this perspective. It's not a difference that we created as parents. Is a follow come difference. So, I, I do this and I ask parents this. Your child is five years old. He's getting a gift in school. The other child is six years old. He's getting a gift in, he's getting a gift in dancing. You're complaining that the one that is getting a gift in school, can't you see your brother is getting a gift in school? The question I ask you, the one that is getting a gift in school, what did you do? At five, to make him get a gift in school. Tell yourself the truth. What did you do, really? Is it the number of hours you spent with him learning by five years old? Is it the hours of, is it the number of prayers you prayed? A lot of times you don't do anything. They're just growing up at five and you see his strength. And they're growing up at seven and you see the strength. Instead of you to tap into the strength and build the strength, you then begin to Compare the strength of your preference with the strength of your prejudice. And then you conclude that this one is doing better. And this one is not doing as good. No. They were showing you their strength, hoping that you will see the strength and help them build the strength. And they're also going to show you their prejudices, hoping that you will see their prejudices and help them counter their prejudices. That's all that was happening. And I can give you a lot of scenarios. The first day Gil got into a swimming pool, he swam. No, but Zeke couldn't swim on the first day. Right? But Zeke likes math math mathematics far beyond what Gil likes. Look at those differences. I, I didn't do anything. They just showed me who they are. Right? And we are waiting to understand Tao. I'm getting it. So, so um, they said I have five minutes. We've only done two. Um, there's no way, uh, sorry, we would be, all right. So the second one is that, to, listen, I think every parent should write it somewhere. Children are different. There's, no, there's nothing more important than that. Love anyone as much as you want. You have to wake up to the realization that they are different. And look into the difference, accept the difference, Work with the difference because there's no one that is good, there's no one that is bad. The challenge is one is good at something and the other is good at something else. And we have to go into that strength. And because I am not a completely good person, I've also got my weaknesses, isn't it? Now, if I have my weaknesses as a parent, why wouldn't a child have their own weaknesses? So, to conclude that a child is a bad child is to have concluded that that weakness part of him is already definite and cannot be changed. No. But if you realize that the child is still growing, is still growing, it means that what you deem to be weak will change. Now, now Gil's teacher has once told me when he was in primary school that he's, he talks too much. When he was in primary four. Now, the teacher in primary one has never said he talks too much. The teacher in primary two has never said he talks too much. The teacher in primary three has never said he talks too much. How come... He woke up in primary four and he started talking too much. Can I tell you what happened? What happened is simple. He had the misfortune of being in the class of a teacher who doesn't like people who talk a lot. And now that teacher concluded that he talks too much. No, he doesn't talk too much. He talks. 
And his father talks to make money. He talks, but he, mis he had a misfortune of being in the class of a teacher that doesn't like people who talk too much. Because she or he doesn't like to talk a lot. Now, is it a child's problem? No. It is the teacher that now realize, should now realize that now I have a student in my class that talks a lot. What am I going to do with this strength? And it takes curiosity to do that, teachers. Are we getting it? They are still forming. It's not about good or bad. It's not about negative or positive. It's not about weak. It's about seeing and realizing and building. Right? The third one. So this, this, this second one, one day I was teaching in First Bank and a woman was crying. I was teaching emotional intelligence and she was crying. Everybody realized she was crying. So we took like a break, you know, because she was really, really sobbing. And then I, I find out what was going on. And we realized that she was thinking about her child in school, how the relationship has broken totally. And we started to look at what was happening. And it was because of this number two that I've said. That child has gone to school. She doesn't wish, at 12, she hates coming back home. And right there in the, in the midst of the training, she called the school and she wanted to talk to the child. And they, they make a, made amendments. She was crying. Are we getting it? Um, because of time. Um, I'll take one more and I'll call Gil to come and sit, tell me what he said in the, in the car. Um, the next one is that children wish that their parents know that they are scared. A lot of times we don't realize that there's fear in the subconscious of a child. But you think that they are being defiant. You know, fear and defiant, right? What's defiant? You think that the child is not wanting to do what you want them to do. And you think they are being defiant. But a lot of times, it's fear. They're scared. They're scared that you're going to repeat what you've done before, which is painful. They're scared that... Um, a lot of things. So if you, don't, if you don't understand that the reason a child is not doing something is not because they are not being defiant. It's, because, it's not because they are being defiant. It's because they are, not, they, are, they are a little scared. Then you won't be able to treat that fear. And if you are not able to treat the fear, you will, um, you will deal with them without being curious enough. Right? That would be number three. Um, Gil, come around. Please let me encourage him. Please put your hands together for him. Please give him the mic. So I asked you something in the car, right? Yes. Um, and please tell them what you said to me that parents need to also know about the child. Yeah. You know, we want to have one good morning. So when we were driving here, my dad asked me, about what parents need to know about their children. And what I said is they are feelings. Parents and other people, they need to know how a kid feels. Because if they don't know how an educated woman, their self-esteem can be broken down. They will not be encouraged to do what they normally like to do. For example, a kid, a kid is important. And instead of asking them how they do and asking them their opinion and their perspective on it, they just go jump into conclusions and just either punish the child or say things that would break the child's surface. And I don't think that's correct. But for me, I have experienced it So, like, yes, that's it. Parents, teachers, they need to understand a child's feelings and ask them how they feel and their perspectives. Don't just jump into their conclusions. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So, so, I'm an emotional intelligence coach, expert, everything, book. I talk about feelings a lot. And my child is saying that we need to ask them more about how they feel. <laughs> So that felt like a blow. 
right? Um, but we're all being vulnerable here. Um, so what that says to me is that I need to ask more. And what I said at the beginning that I hope is not because I always talk about feeling, that feeling came to his head. Um, so I, but I think he's very correct. Um, do you ask your child how your child feels about something? Feeling. So there are three things we're constantly doing in the world of emotional intelligence. That the, the thoughts, what is the child thinking? Or what we're always thinking, we're always feeling, and we're always acting. We call it TFA. We're always thinking, we're always feeling, and we're always acting. And the child is also always thinking, always feeling, and also always acting. Um, one of the things that we need to know is that the child wish we know how they feel about the situation. And it's very simple. All you need to do is to be a little bit patient and say, how are you feeling about this? Now, that doesn't stop you from doing whatever you want to do. But guess what? It will guide you. It, would, it will guide you. It will, it, will, it will instruct you. It will show you. Because feelings are data. You know, uh, in the world of emotional intelligence, we say feelings are data. Data is unprocessed information. So when you tap into the feeling of someone and it's data and you process the information, what's going to happen? You will be instructed. Right? You will be instructed. So, um, I think that that's also extremely important. And, and the way to do it is to ask them, in the midst of all that you're asking them, what do you feel about what has just happened? If they say they feel sad, that's okay. It's a feeling. If they feel angry, don't get angry because the child is saying he's angry. <laughs> Just take it as data, take it as information, take it as something you want to use, right? Um, um, not agreeing, another one would be, the fact that the child does not agree with you doesn't mean the child is being disrespectful. Are you getting it? The fact that the child does not agree with you doesn't mean they are not being, they are being disrespectful. In fact, please teach your children to know how to say no. So come and do this thing and they say no. It's okay to say no. But be curious about the no. Understand the no before you decide whether they must do it or not. You see that little space is what we are all missing. And, and a, a lady that does not know how to say no in a world that we are today, you know that that lady will suffer. Right? Uh, so, the capacity to say no is actually strength. Is actually what? Strength. It takes strength. It takes courage for a woman to say no to her husband. For a young lady to say no to her boyfriend. For a child to say no to her parent. And then we want to beat that no out so that they will be saying yes. What we don't know is that we are beating courage out. By the time a child grows up and he doesn't have the capacity to say no again, it's not about the no anymore. It's that the child has lost confidence and courage. So that everything that happens now is yes. It means that every life situation they just accept. So enjoy it when your child says no and disagree with you. I'm not saying allow it. What did I say? I, I didn't say allow it. I said enjoy it. It means that you understand it. You ask questions about it. And then you cannot conclude whether you are going to accept that no or not. So you're not going to accept every no. You're not going to accept every yes. But you'll be able to deal with every no and every yes to the extent that you'll be able to take information out of it and then help the child to grow. The goal is to build the child into confidence. What we are doing now, is it going to give the child confidence? And today they, they are co-parenting successfully because of one thing. She always asks herself, what is the goal of what is happening now? Does the goal tie to the goal that I want for these children? If it's no, she will just come. Because she realized that some of her goal is that she doesn't want the child to be like the father. That's the goal. Another goal is that she doesn't want the child to spend so much time with the father. Are those goals? Is that a big goal? If you say, what's your goal for the child? You say, my goal for this child is that it should not, look for, it should not, it should not resemble the father. What kind of goal is that? That goal will continue to tell you what to do, and it'll be wrong. If the goal is to build this guy into a confident adult who is going to live life at full crush and live a happy life, then let everything tie to that goal. Taking him away from that father is not that goal. 
is your own goal. Right? It's not an overarching goal. Um, I, I, I hope that this, these are things that we teach for days and all of that. Teachers, my takeaway for you is that how you teach is more important than what you teach. Let me say that again. How you teach is more important than what you teach. Hey, so what do you want to teach? You want to teach elementary science. You want to teach, you, you've got a note that you must cover, right? You are teaching impatiently. That your impatience is destroying the what. The impatience is the how. The note is the what. That your impatience is destroying the notes that you want to teach. You are teaching sadly because your boyfriend just did something, gave you breakfast yesterday. How you are teaching with your sadness is more important than the notes. The children don't go away with the what. They go away with the how. A teacher that procrastinates will build a procrastinating child. Saying don't procrastinate doesn't matter. How you procrastinate inside the class? A teacher that is always in a hurry. A teacher that shows preferences and prejudice. I like this one, I don't like this one. The children are learning those things. They now know that it's okay to like some people and not like some people push me away. Just ask yourself, how am I teaching? Are you teaching irritatingly? Are you teaching wickedly? Are you teaching excitingly? Are you teaching um, patiently? Those, those adjectives and those hows are the most important thing with what you teach. So at least ask yourself, how am I teaching now? You see, if they've not paid your salary, it will affect how you teach. And it is the how that the children really takes away, not the what. And I think the same thing can also apply to the parents. So these are some of the things that these children wish we know about them that we don't. And I hope that um, that's enough for us to adjust a little. Right. Thank you.